Hi, my name is Lalvin Gossier, and I'm co-chairing the Neuroplasticity Group at ACRM. I'm pleased to introduce my postdoctoral fellow, fellow Dr. Maron Rafi, and he's going to be talking today about how to use his expertise, which is how to analyze large neuroimaging data sets using advanced data analytics. And uh, Maron comes with a long list of qualifications and has developed several new techniques to process using neural network approaches, large data sets. I'll take it over, Maron. Thank you very much, Dr. Gautier, for the introduction. So this is Mohammed Rafi. I'm a postdoctoral researcher with Ohio State University. I'm going to actually start the first st slide. And you know, today, we are going to actually talk and focus on some uh, interesting uh, methods for analyzing very large data sets of brain-based data using uh, advanced data analytics or computational approaches. Here is the learning objectives that we will talk about today. We first start with an introduction to machine learning techniques, uh, and then we can actually talk about some optimization algorithms and some metrics that we have developed here at Ohio State University. And then eventually we will end the presentation with some examples of how to use these computational algorithms in a multi-paradigm interface. We will get familiar with a few computational techniques that can help us address the challenges we have with neuroimaging data to some extent. The questions such as how to make big sense of data like fMRI data, EEG records, kinematic time series, and how to reduce the dimensionality of data or how to discover or extract relevant information from the, from the data are going to be answered to some extent. I'm doing my best to not go over complicated mathematical equations when I'm explaining these techniques, but I may cheat to some extent. So now an introduction to machine learning techniques. Um, Machine learning algorithms are inspired from the ability of human brain to learn or solve an estimation or recognition problem. Similar to human brain, they need a training phase to be um, ready uh, for an estimation or recognition problem, like a student who needs to study her or his course materials to be prepared for the exam day. Such algorithms have been employed in developing driverless cars to recognize the lanes, adjacent vehicles, traffic signs, speed limits, traffic lights, and act the best to prevent accidents or uh, to reduce the probability of injuries or fatalities. Another example is the smartphones that now see you through their facial recognition systems and hear you through their smart voice recognition systems, for example, Siri and iPhone. These algorithms have been used to help physicians for a more accurate prognosis. For example, our research team at Ohio State University showed that with implementation of techniques such as Bayesian-based classifiers and wavelet transform to analyze EEG records and accuracy of prognosis of ep epilepsy in very early stages can be improved from around 65% by physician to near 100% by machine. Our main purpose will not be removing the role of physician but getting help from artificial intelligence, neural networks, or machine learning systems for prognosis purposes. Like we said, neural networks algorithms are inspired from brain. But before going deep through how they work mathematically, we need to take a look at how brain processes information to some extent. Our brain receives information through our sensory inputs and is able to process them, um, and it is able to automatically extract features from the inputs and what it receives. The brain is able to extract some common features that makes the smiley shape and the lady's face into the same category of being happy or being upset. Remember, the smiley shape is just a bunch of curves and lines. Brain is able to extract uncommon features that identify the first row as cats and the second row as ducks. Hence, our brain is able to extract the common and uncommon features among the data it receives through the sensory inputs. So is an artificial neural network. Artificial intelligence uh, techniques benefits from mathematical or statistical techniques to extract features from a set of inputs, such as sensory inputs. 
we can measure these uh, cats and dogs characteristics and features like their weights, their size, their DNA information. We can turn the features and characteristics into numerical values and call it a data point and place them in a like a vector. We, we call such a vector a data, data point. A learning technique like a classifier requires a training phase to learn from a bunch of data points. It needs to be well trained and um, be prepared for the exam day when a testing data needs to be classified. For example, is that tiger in category one or category two, which is basically a challenging question. Machine learning techniques can be usually shown schematically. I can show, show the picture of it for you. Uh, their jargons are not strange for neuroimaging specialists. They usually have an input layer <clears throat> of neurons to receive the data points and other layers of neurons <clears throat> for the purpose of feature extraction. The basis is simple. A simple mathematic or probability theory or stochastic analysis. They seem to be hard to learn because they need computers to show that they are working. It is about computer power to compute probability equations for us quickly. So there are basically two types of machine learning algorithms. First is supervised learning and the second is unsupervised. The supervised learning algorithms have an output layer. And the goal there is classification, estimation, or prognosis. For example, is that tiger in the category of cats or the category of ducks? Unsupervised learning, in case of unsupervised learning, there is no output layer. They do not need the data points they receive to be categorized. Instead, they identify and separate the common and uncommon characteristics among data points. Instead of having an image with 100,000 pixels, the unsupervised learning extract uh, patterns and features among those pixels. So we have fewer features that represent the big size image. For example, they are able to see edges, the location of eyes, location of lips, and, and the common features among the dogs and cats without knowing which image is a cat or a dog. In clinical application, for example, you can extract features from EEG data, EMG data, or fMRI images. Now I'm going to go a little bit deep into the supervised algorithm. So there are two types of supervised machine learning algorithms. First is classification algorithms, which their output is in the form of categories, groups, classes, lab labels. There are like positive integers. The second group is the regression algorithms that their outputs are in the form of real values, like continuous values. Supervised machine learning algorithms require a training phase. If we have a bunch of supervised data points, like clinical test scores, and by supervised, we mean that the outputs are available. For example, the categories are available, and categories can address a clinical condition. We can divide them into training and testing data points, where training data points are used to train the algorithm, and testing are to test the training algorithm. Remember, since our data repository is supervised, we have the, real, the, the privilege of having the real outputs of all our data points, including testing data points. So we can compare our estimation to real values and measure an accuracy percentage or an error. The question is that how to divide your data points into testing and training data points, and how many testing, how many training. For the question of how many, we can define a ratio of testing to training. We call it RTT in our literature, in our machine, in the machine learning literature. For example, an RTT of 25% means that 25% of our data points will be taken away as testing data points and the rest as, as training. For how do we divide, we can answer randomly. However, when we measure the accuracy, the testing uh, data set might, might include those data points that are too easy or too hard to classify, like an easy exam or a too hard exam. There's a bias there. To prevent this statistical bias, we can create multiple sets of randomly divided testing and training sets say 100 of them, for a number of RTTs, like five RTTs, like 10%, 20%, 30%, or 
This is called repeated random sampling in machine learning literatures. For example, here we create 100 sets of training testing data points for an RTT of 25%, and we, we report the average accuracy of 100 training testing. Now the question is that how we can use all these in our research. I'm going to give, provide you an example of our previous works. So what you see the, there as the image is the architecture of an enhanced probabilistic neural network. It's a supervised classifier. I want you to just pay attention only to the input layer and the output layer. In the previous slide, we had an example that our data points are two dimensional. The horizontal axis is one clinical metric and the vertical is another clinical metric. But in this problem, we, we have 18 actually metrics or 18, it's an 18 dimensional uh, problem. If you look at the input layer, you're gonna see 18 variables there and there is one output and that's, that's the class number. So what we wanna do here is we want to see which baseline characteristics predict extent of motor recovery using the classifier in chronic stroke. So we know that, um, you know, we know that, um, uh, we know that not all the predictors are helping in correct prediction. And uh, in the other hand, we know our classifier is advanced and is able, able to find a highly nonlinear relationship among the pred among our predictors. So if you look at the predictors, there's a stroke affect affected size, and 15 volt motor function tests values and two somatosensation sensation tests, a total of 18. We will train and test our classifier using all the possible combina combinations of these 18 input values. And it's like totally 262,000 combinations. And for that, we needed Ohio supercomputer facilities to run our algorithms. We arrange the data and run the EPN and using these uh, repeated random sampling techniques we can find the accuracies of each of these combinations. For each combination, we compute the average accuracy, like say 100 training and testing sets. And here our um, basically RTT is only about 3%. We found that 52 out of all these combinations of predictors just yielded an accuracy of near 100%. And among them, we found that the most frequently selected in predictor among different combinations were fine motor related Wolf motor function test items. And we could find our baseline characteristics. Here we have a significant conclusion. And that is that uh, a high predictive accuracy can be achieved using only a small sampling of motor tests that can be very quickly administrated. So um, we are going, going to talk about the unsupervised learning algorithm and how we can use it in our research. So unsupervised algorithm have no output layer. Like I said, they are being used for extracting common and uncommon hidden features in coding among, among available data points. They mimic the way brain extract features from faces and sounds, like location of eyes, if, if it is sound recognition, like accents, this kind of stuff. So they can create a low dimensional representation of large data because they can see the patterns in the data instead of the whole data. For example, you can see the picture or the image of the restricted Boltzmann machine as an unsupervised learning, which, uh, which is a simple two layer interconnected neural network. There are two layers there, an input layer and a hidden layer. They are connected with each other by connection bits. The goal here is to train this model such if we input a data point, it extracts uncommon features into the hidden layer, the top layer, using the common features that are embedded in the wave connections. And then when we reconstruct the input layer again using the transpose of the wave connections, the reconstruction, we need it to be very similar to the actual input. This mimics the way brain to remember a face or sound. So we want that, what we remember or reconstruct to be very similar to the actual inputs. In this case, if the value of J in the hidden layer is less than the size of our input data, we can say that hidden layer will be a lower dimensional representation of the input layer. 
Here is, a, is an example. You know, in case of face recognition uh, problems, we can actually comprehend these uncommon features in the form of edges uh, and, you know, the penistokes or edges of the images. You can see those zombie faces in the middle that are the common features among all the images that you see in this example. There are other examples of unsupervised learning algorithms, and one example is those algorithms that are, are within the deep learning interface. They are known as high performance algorithms for big data. The goal in deep learning interface is to extract features from already extracted features and repeat this multiple times. It's, it mimics the way that we think about something in our brain. So we think and interpret the features, and we do that multiple times. For example, Deep Boltzmann machine is made of several layers of restricted Boltzmann machine where the hidden layer of one restricted Boltzmann machine is the input layer of the next one. And it tries to simulate the deep learning ability of brain to extract features from the already extracted features. So Deep Boltzmann machine has an encoder um, where the features are extracted and the dimension of the data is reduced and the code there to postulate the construction or the remembering procedure. The middle layer or the last layer of encoder can be used uh, as the lower dimensional representative of our inputs. So Deep Boltzmann machine has a pre-training procedure that boosts up its learning ability for a very short amount of time. As an example, we can feed Deep Boltzmann machine with frequency domain of an EEG record or fMRI images to extract features from it for classification purposes. Remember that epilepsy problem. Deep learning algorithms can work with fMRI, EEG, kinematic time series, EMG records, or test scores, and uh, any dimensional or large data sets. Another famous deep learning algorithm is convolutional neural networks, which are recommended for image pro processing problems. DBM or Deep Boltzmann machine is good in CPU systems and convolutional neural networks is good in GPU systems. However, you can run um, convolutional neural networks on CPUs, but it's tens of times faster on GPU systems, which are usually more expensive. Uh, the other benefit of Deep, Deep Boltzmann machine is that uh, it actually accounts for higher memory capability compared to just restricted Boltzmann machine. I'm going to talk about the Bayesian-based algorithms and how we can use it in our research program. So um, one very important compu co component of Bayesian-based algorithms is the probability density function. The key idea in Bayesian-based probability density function is that the, you know, the probability of a data point, like X being similar to another data point, Y, is increased when they are closer to each other. The concept of similarity can be addressed by Gaussian probability density function. For example, you can see that green equation that starts with a Greek letter phi. That's a probability density function that measures the similarity of two data points with, it, with, it, with each other. And the term sigma there address how distorted is the Euclidean space for an accurate estimation of the similarity. Here is an example of how we can use this uh, similarity or probability density function. So in this example, a Gaussian probability density function has been used to show the similarity of two clinical metrics in a stroke. The first metric is the change in the intensity of every brain wax cells over the therapy intervention. And the second metric addresses the changes in motor performance over the course of therapy. The redder means higher similarities. So our research team at Ohio State University even developed a more enhanced version of the probability density function, which they take into account the local density of the data points to address this distortion problem more accurately. We call this enhanced probability density function. Whether you use enhanced probability density function or normal density ordinary the probability density function, you can use them in uh, Bayesian-based classifiers like probabilistic on enhanced probability neural networks by computing the average likelihood of how our data points are 
as uh, you know, what, what is the likelihood of our data point being in different clusters of data. For more information, you can actually read, uh, you know, this paper, Enhanced Probabilistic Neural Network, and to get access to a more advanced neural network um, classifier, Bayesian-based classifiers, you can actually uh, study one of uh, our very new uh, algorithms that is called Neural Dynamic Classification Algorithm that was basically the core chapter of my PhD dissertation and is more accurate than many classifiers. We have shown the implementation of these Bayesian-based classifiers into two of, of our recently published papers in the Behavioral, Behavioral, Behavioral Brain Research Journal. So now I'm going to talk about the optimization algorithms and how we can use it in uh, clinical research. So first I start with the definition of a formal optimization problems. So a formal optimization problem has a fitness or objective function of a number of design variables, like that function of O that you see up there. And that function is sometimes something that you can basically draw it, like the figure in the middle, you can see the dark blue curve, you can, you can draw your objective function. And sometimes it's just, it can be just a black box, box that you input it some variables and it gets some, gets some output. For example, you want to find the, you, you, you input a therapy intervention, some design variables and you expect some out of, output out of it. Uh, we also have some constraints that our design variables need to satisfy them. So the goal here is that is to find the optimum set of design variables that maximizes or minimizes our objective function. And at the same time, they satisfy all the inequality constraints and the equality constraint. For example, you want to find the optimum therapy components such maximize the individual improvement and those components are within a certain limits. So in order to solve an optimization problem, we can do try and error, but that is not basically practical for big data. Like in some problems that we have solved, we had like 11,000 design variables to be optimized. So in those cases, we use optimization algorithms, such as gen genetic algorithms, particle swarm algorithms as an example of nature-inspired uh, optimization algorithms, or imperialist competitive algorithm as an example of a, social uh, inspired, social inspired optimization algorithm, and a more robust optimization algorithm that is uh, the, actually the patented uh, algorithm of our research team that is called Neural Dynamic Optimization Algorithm. I'm going to talk about some um, a new clinical metric that we propose uh, that is called normalcy index here. So you remember we talked these probability density functions that are able to actually measure for us similarities be, uh, among our data points. So we propose uh, an index using these probability density functions, we propose an index to address how normal an, uh, an individual's record of information is compared to the same information acquired from a standard or normal population. And the key idea here is that the closer is the case record or an individual record to the cluster of normal or standard data, the more normal is that record. We calibrate this index such it goes between zero and one, where zero indicates a very abnormal and one indicates a very normal information. We propose a linear form of normal index, but furthermore, we improve it using prob uh, probability density functions to take into account the distortion of the Euclidean space as well. And um, that term sigma that addresses the distortion of our Euclidean space here has a very interesting therapeutic meaning here. So a small value of sigma can be encouraging at the beginning of a therapy and it magnifies the improvement of individuals at the start. It's like our therapies has a low expectation while a large value of sigma provides better observation of a small variation of records from the individual at the compilation of therapy and challenges our individual to achieve higher scores. It's like our therapies has a higher expectation. So we include the therapies bias here. The value of sigma 
uh, such, uh, you know, it is, it, it has no bias, can be actually estimated using, uh, uh, by definition, by defining a kind of optimization problem that we already talked about. And this optimization for problem uh, has an objective function and some inequality and uh, constraints to, met, to be met. And we can actually solve this problem using different optimization algorithms that we already uh, pointed out for you. So now uh, we talk about some machine learning techniques and some optimization algorithms, but now we get more practical into our uh, uh, presentation here. And I'm gonna actually introduce you this multi-paradigm alg algorithms that we are employing in uh, for to solve the big data problems we have in medicine and clinical applications, clinical problems. Um, so multi-paradigm uh, expert systems or machine learning techniques are developed by combination of uh, some of these algorithms that we mentioned, like, like by the combination of advanced machine learning techniques like deep learning techniques and also advanced signal processing techniques like wavelet transform or synchronous with wavelet transform or advanced optimization algorithms like neurodynamic optimization or enhanced Bayesian based algorithms like enhanced probabilistic density functions. For example, you see here that, you know, you know, this is an example that we had like EEG records from an individual and then those EEG records, or, or it can be time series records, it can be fMRI records, but here you have a noisy record or noisy data and you use some signal processing algorithms to denoise the record and remove the artifacts or spikes or tremors in the data. And then you may want to transform it into frequency domain using some methods like fast Fourier transform uh, the frequency domain where the important characteristics of the signals are embedded in. And then you can input that into a deep learning machine learning algorithm for feature extractions and pattern recognitions uh, from your data. So I'm giving you an example of a dose response model or an adaptive model here uh, for a better understanding of multi pattern algorithms. So here we have, you know, some tropy components or tropy variables that each one has a dose and you have to design those dose based on the individual's characteristics in your therapy. So then you're going to actually ask your individual to perform the therapy and uh, those, you know, the information from the individual is going to be actually sent to the computers. The computers are going to done some pre-processing of the data and then the data are going to be ready for our, uh, you know, multi paradigm algorithm. And uh, let's say if this is like you know, re records from the kinematic series or fMRI data or EEG records, you need to denoise it. You need to do all those steps I talked about and do the feature extraction using a deep learning interface. And then eventually what you get as your features or lower dimensional representation of your big data can be used to compute a normalcy index using the normalcy index that we propose. So you can use this big gray box here as what, what they call the black box uh, in, in the optimization um, uh, slide. So this black box or this gray box can be an objective function of an optimization algorithm. Where, and the goal here can be finding the optimum variables, therapy dosage, such the probability of getting higher normalcy index is maximized. So you can solve this problem using uh, the optimization techniques that we already described. Um, of course, uh, your you know, different variables you have based, based on the therapy, based on the problem you have, uh, are also within some limits. And those are the constraints of the optimization problem. In our research program with Dr. Lingat here, <clears throat> we have this recovery rapids for um, uh, that, that actually use uh, game-based systems for um, re movement recovery in stroke and MS patients. So this recovery has some components, like design components that I talked about. And, you know, in, in this figure, you can see that using some multi-paradigm algorithms, we were able to compute the normalcy index for one particular individual. 
It's like 1500 records of one of these therapeutic gestures that we extract from our big data, like terabytes of data that we have. And then uh, you can see that the normalcy of that therapeutic gestures over the course of the treatment and over like 30 sessions are improving and improving. And you see that here by looking into the data and this normal index that we develop. So that shows that if you have these, you know, um, um, use these um, multi-paradigm uh, advanced computational algorithm, algorithms, you can basically uh, provide the patient with some feedback, like you can use it for neurofeedback, or you can actually manage your therapy, or your therapist can manipulate or change or modify the therapy variables such your therapy going to assign more time to those components of therapy that you're getting more improvement from, or the trajectories of the improvements are uh, actually toward the positive and higher. So you wouldn't actually stop that. But if you have some uh, curves here or normal indices that you see that the patients go th toward the plateau very fast, you might stop actually um, uh, feeding the patients or reduce the frequency of that ther therapeutic components in your uh, therapy program. So today I talked with you, <clears throat> I gave you an introduction to the machine learning techniques. We talked about the supervised algorithm on supervised learning and I just gave you an introduction to Bayesian based probability density functions. We talked about the formal optimization uh, problem and it's different uh, algorithms that we can use to solve a an optimization algorithms. We introduced you a new uh, clinical index that we developed that called normal index. And then eventually I showed you how you can actually combine these algorithms together to create a multi-paradigm advanced computational te techniques to handle your big data problem. I would like to thank our research, uh, research team, especially Dr. Lingatier uh, for all their support and um, to basically using all these algorithms in their research programs and their trust on me. And we have developed very interesting algorithms, very interesting um, um, research we are conducting here. And I would like to appreciate all of them for all their support and help. And thank you all for listening to me. So what questions do you have? Just a reminder, if people have questions, they may need to unmute their lines. Um, so I just chatted uh, with you, and I was just asking if you would be interested in writing up a nice scoping review of this. I really think this is a nice um, introduction in how the world of rehabilitation can apply and use machine learning. So I was wondering if you would be um, interested in submitting that scoping review to JHTR. Uh, actually, uh, that would be, that is a very interesting, actually, suggestion. Um, yeah, I would like to write a review of all these algorithms and, you know, to basically, um, it's, it's motivating because it helps um, people in the medicine and in, 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 in you know, uh, in the College of Medicine across the globe to get uh, familiar with this techniques and, um, you know, I love to, you know, do that and I put aside time for that. Thank you very much for this suggestion. Okay, great. I'll speak with um, John Corrigan. So this is Teresa. I'm, in the, I'm on the editorial board. So I'll just see if um, I'll, I'll run it by him and um, hopefully help you facilitate that. Sure. Thank you. So what are the questions that you guys have? I'm waiting to receive more questions from you. I have another question if no one else is asking. Um, what's the minimum sample size, if you will, or data bytes that you need to have? Um, so I'm thinking of the rarer conditions um, for people. So when we talk big data, what's the minimum that you would need in order to be able to write a reasonably accurate algorithm? Uh, 
you know, many of the results that we are getting are a function of the data um, samples. Um, the ac their accuracies and the reliability of the results that we report are somehow um, a function of the, you know, the size of the sample. Because when, when you have more samples, you can actually Pro, you can actually get some uh, information about a bigger sample or the whole population that you are actually doing research on. Uh, but the thing here is that, you know, to answer the question, there is, uh, it's problem dependent. It depends on the problem. Depending on the problem, we can actually um, define some reliability of the results we are getting from these algorithms, and we can report some accuracy or error to address that how, um, um, accurate are the algorithms that we develop or how, you know, if you have a small sample data, but your problem, um, you know, the, the patterns among your data points are not that much, you know, nonlinear and it's, e it's easier for a classifier to find the patterns, you probably don't need uh, a large amount of data. But if there are complications and the level of nonlinearity of your problem is high, it's better to have more data. But the privilege of using advanced computational techniques is that when you don't have a big data, they are able to, you know, they are better in finding the patterns among the, your data compared to just simple statistical techniques. So the answer to your question is that uh, there is no specific number I can give you. It's problem dependent, it requires try and error, and then eventually what we report is a statistical. And we say our results are accurate or reliable to some extent, and that extent we should define it. Yeah, because it's a probability-based exactly. estimate, right? So you're giving the probability that this result is the accurate one essentially yeah. is what you're, yeah. you're driving this rather than the specific I mean it can give you a regression number but uh, it, it does give you a probability yeah and, and, and small data sets might not actually include um, you know the real outliers that are, are, are there or just include the outli outliers that are there so uh, it's kind of problem dependent, and like Dr. Gautier said, it's about probabilities. So we can actually report the probabilities. We can we can say about the reliability of our results by reporting the probability of how accurate uh, they are. And and I think sample size means a different thing here too than uh, what it typically means in neuro in neuroimaging literature. Typically, sample size means the number of subjects that you have. Here, it doesn't necessarily have to be the number of subjects. We can do this with a large data set within a particular subject. And that's the key difference. If you have a lot of data on one particular subject, say they were scanned you know, 20, 30, 40 times over, over a time series, then you have a lot of data points within one particular subject and you can learn from that. Um, an example of how we used it in our kinematic analysis is we had 15 hours of kinematic data on each person. So we were able to get very precise estimates of the recovery trajectory on each movement because they were doing, each person was doing so much, obtaining so many data points. I and mean, we were getting upwards of 2,500 data points for each movement. So it's, even though we didn't have a, a huge number of subjects, we're able to get very precise estimates of how a person is benefiting because we have so much data from each participant. Right, thanks. Um, okay, thank you. That helps me triage it a bit, thanks. Sure. And I think that it also depends somewhat on the number of predictors you have too, right? Oh, uh, yeah. So what well, you can use optimization, we talked about the feature extraction or mentioned the feature extraction techniques so this is a way to minimize the amount of variables that you're putting into your model essentially yes. so it's a way to reduce he talked about it as reducing the dimensionality but basically that means instead of if you had an image with a hundred thousand voxels you don't have a hundred thousand you you extract what the features are the patterns of what patterns are you seeing in those voxels and you may only have 20 or 25 features within that 100,000 
uh, data voxels. So you can decrease the number of things that are going into your model that way too. Yeah. So that you don't have the those huge, you know, you don't have to bond, use a bond for only correction and degrade your power entirely, for example. Right, right. All those repeated measures get you every time. Um, right. I just have some nice cross-sectional data on mild TBI and with and without all kinds of co-occurring conditions. And I'm in this unique position right now where with my clinical trial, I will actually be using that data to diagnose patients just as part of the inclusion criteria. So I'll actually know if my risk, my, my predictor variables are actually accurate in predicting if they would have been eligible for the trial. Um, and I was just sort of thinking that it's a unique opportunity to possibly apply machine learning here to create the algorithm, the prediction algorithm, and then compare it with the actual that I'm currently accruing into my trial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say if you have a, a large complex data data sets is, is where you would use this. So if you're measuring upwards of 10, 10 variables on each person. And, <laughs> I have and over a thousand per person. And yeah, uh, over there's thousand, over a thousand yeah. per person and we got about 460 in the database. Yeah, you're not going to be able to, to run regressions on those to see what comes out, right? So you need, you need a more sophisticated technique to identify those patterns in the data because humans can't do that. We can't keep so that that's what I was, mind. Yeah, so that's what I was thinking in my head as I was listening so, to this young man. I think my webcam was off, right? Oh, I can turn it on. <laughs> I've just been multitasking, and so I didn't want you to <laughs> get distracted. Yeah, so our webcam was off as well. So I don't know if you, um, and I actually disconnected the, um, Headset. So oh, are we disconnected yeah. from the webinar now? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're still on. So, yeah. you know, before we end, if there's no more questions, I'd like to thank uh, Meron for sharing his expertise, and feel free to reach out to him uh, if you have any questions or ideas for how you might collaborate. Yeah, this is my information. You can see there. Oh. Good. And uh, if you have any questions, you can actually send an email using that email address. Or if you want to get more familiar with our line of work, you can look into my website there. And we can go from there. Thanks for your attendance. Thank you very much. Bye bye, you guys. Bye bye. Well done.